following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. As the fourth and fifth graders are taking off, if you would, grab your Bibles. Uh, open up to Matthew chapter 7. Uh, Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount today. Um, and then let me show you kind of where we're headed. Um, next week, uh, prof- Professor Tiberius Ratza will be with us to talk about Thanksgiving. He's from Grace College. He is from Romania. And he is the only guy that says my name the way it should be said. Jordan. Jordan, what's wrong with you, Jordan? Um, and so I could listen to him talk for hours, not just because he loves Jesus, but it's always easier to listen to somebody with an accent, and they sound much, so much more profound, right? Like, they could be like, cheese pizza is the best thing in the world, and you'd be like, absolutely, 100%. <clears throat> um, make it a meme, whatever. Uh, and then uh, we're going to pause for Christmas, okay? Uh, so we're going to spend four weeks in the Old Testament talking about Jesus and um, just kind of what the Old Testament prophets and the law say about Jesus and what we need to know. Um, So this year we're going to spend some Old Testament time uh, together there. And then we'll pick back up in uh, in, uh, Matthew chapter 7, the first of the year. We'll finish this up and then I'll tell you where we're going when we get there. Okay, so Matthew chapter 7, Jesus has already articulated uh, a lot of things uh, about being his follower and his disciple. And then we get to um, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, and he's going to talk about judging. Um, Tiberius, like I said, was from, is from Grace College, and uh, he is technically my boss because I teach a class at Grace. I teach a couple classes at Grace um, and have the opportunity to do so. And last class that I had, there was uh, a girl who sat in the front row, and she would eat a Pop-Tart every single um, time that she came into class. And um, she started this whole trend, and she was um, shoving this Pop-Tart, like, in her, her mouth. And I'm watching her do this. She has no idea that I'm, I'm watching her. And uh, she inhaled one and then just, just tore into the next one, right? Like, there's two of them, and you're supposed to go slow with Pop-Tarts because they're a delicacy. <laughs> and she's just shoving these in her mouth. And um, I look at her. And I'm just dumbfounded that this is transpiring in the class. And uh, with, with crumbs like spilling out of her mouth hole, she looks at me and says, don't judge me. <laughs> and I want to be like, but I am, right? I am t- I'm totally judging you. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. He says, uh, judge not, lest you be judged. And sometimes people say that because they want to continue in their own personal shortcomings or sin. There's a lot of times that you'll hear somebody say, don't judge me. Uh, I hear it all the time. I counted this week uh, just to see how many people would say it. Uh, I had 15 people that said, don't judge me this week. Not even lying. Like, I was clocking in my head from the time we left Sunday, okay, of last week to this morning. 15 people, don't judge me. <laughs> I'm like, what does that even mean? Oh, I know what that means now, okay? And what uh, I'm learning is people often say that because they're stuck in some sort of rut. They can't get out of that rut, and so they just look at you, and they're like, hey, go look somewhere else. Um, and Jesus tells us that we're supposed to love him well, and he's already talked about that, like things like fasting and prayer and um, things like what we do with our possessions. But the two greatest commandments are this. You should love the Lord God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Right? But you also love your neighbor as yourself in a non-judgmental attitude. Well, what does that look like for me to love my neighbor with a non-judgmental attitude as I'm loving God in a relationship of faith through Christ? Because you cannot be in a relationship with God unless you are engaged in a relationship with Christ through faith. Christ died on the cross, his blood was shed for you, and so it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. You're trusting in Christ that his way is a better way, and that when you get to heaven, he's going to look at you and say, this is why you get in, is because you trusted in me and in me alone, nothing else. Not in your works, not in anything else. So if you confess that you're a sinner and believe that Christ is your savior, you will be saved. And I think sometimes in our lives, it's easy to love God, but it's hard to love your neighbor. 
because I see so many of my own sins and shortcomings in my neighbor, and I'm oftentimes being critical against them instead of helping to build them up. And that's Jesus's whole message for us today, okay? So uh, am I judging somebody or am I declaring the truth? Let's look at this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. For with judgment, you pronounce that you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. You could essentially say that Jesus is saying the same thing twice. Circle that word judge. Judge means to evaluate or analyze in a very critical way. Now, it doesn't matter if you're sitting there hearing Jesus preach from the hillside as his disciple, one of the 12, or the followers who left everything to follow him, or you're sitting here today. When you heard that word judge, you thought what everybody thought, the judge who sits on the bench and who evaluates cases, the judge who looks at all the evidence, he analyzes it, he evaluates it, and then he arrives at a proper conclusion before handing down his sentence. They would have thought that about judging. We think the same thing about judging. But what Jesus says here is he says, you judge somebody else when you remove that judge from the courtroom and you step into his place and you analyze in a critical way somebody who is in front of you in a non-God-honoring way so that you feel better about yourselves for your own shortcomings. That's when you judge. So when he says, judge not, he's saying you cannot analyze critically with a God lens because God is the judge. You are mankind and you are called to show mercy and grace and understand that you too have fallen short of the glory of God. So judging here is harvesting a hypocritical attitude that tears somebody else down so that you feel better about yourself. And if we were to be honest, every one of us has done that. Anybody want to say Amen. Okay, thank you. I got one. <laughs> so judge not, okay? Now, what he's not saying here is that you shouldn't say things from a standpoint that is right and wrong. We believe that all 66 books of the Bible are God-given, God-breathed, and able to teach us, able to encourage us, able to build us up. We would say this is the standard in which we're supposed to live. When we become disciples of Jesus Christ, this is the standard, nothing else. I conform to the image of Christ through what his word says. And Jesus, if he were standing here in physical form, he would say, do not cease to communicate to others right from wrong. There is a difference between discernment and there is a difference between judgment. There's a difference between discerning right and wrong and judging another person. While we as believers are called to show unconditional love to people, we are not called to give unconditional approval. We as believers called by Christ to give unconditional love, but not unconditional approval. So when am I not judging? All right, well, let me give you some um, situations. When somebody uses the Bible in a way that it is not supposed to be used or in its proper context. That's not judging. You look at somebody and they uh, spout off a Bible verse and you'd be like, I, I don't think you got that right. That's not in proper context. This is how we understand in context what the Bible has to say. Verse goes to chapter, chapter goes to book, book goes to genre, genre goes to testament, testament goes to Bible. Okay? So we're constantly understanding the Bible as an onion that has many layers and exposing false teachers is not judging somebody. It's a clarification of what is right and what is wrong. It is not warning somebody about something that is transpiring in their life that's going to cause them great harm. Okay, let's say you leave church, right? And you go out on the highway and you see that there's an individual who's standing on that brand new bridge right in the middle of the road. Cars whizzing by left and right. And you're thinking to yourself, that doesn't look right. Like, that's, that's not right. So you roll down your window and, as a concerned citizen and you say, excuse me, I don't think you should be walking in the middle of the road. You're just giving them warning, right? They're like, oh, great. Oh, absolutely. Giving warning to somebody who is in a situation that causes them harm is not judging. All right? If you have a friend who is caught up in things that they are participating in, let's say they're in a relationship with somebody and when they're supposed to be in a relationship with somebody else, and you're warning them that this isn't good in their life. That's not judging them. That's just clarifying to them that they're in harm, in danger. That's not judging, okay? Well, when am I judging? 
I'm judging when I become hypercritical or start to condemn that person and act like the judge when it's God's job. I am judging when my fallen flesh wants to analyze somebody else's life instead of evangelize to them. When I look at them and say, oh, you're doing that specific thing, and so therefore I don't do that specific thing, I feel better about myself, and I can remain in my sin, and you are, and can remain in your sin. That's judging. So we discipline ourselves when that thought comes into our mind to take it captive and to stop, or we too will be judged. So he says, judge not, lest you, look at the second part of that verse, be judged. Jesus does not prohibit the analyzation of another person's life, but the way in which you analyze somebody's life and understand that you too could sin in that specific way. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. Each one of you should build with care. Build what? Build up good works that are honoring to God in acts of worship, including the way that you think about the people who are in your everyday life. He says that you don't have to give unconditional approval, but you can still give unconditional love and help them in that situation. So he continues, he says, with the same measure. Now we go back into this time period with these Jews who had rabbis who were their teachers. And rabbinical law taught in Jesus' time that God had two measures to judge people. He had actual judgment, but he also had mercy. In the Old Testament, what we see is the prophets would warn people in a proper way, not judging, but they would tell people, this is what is to come if you continue in disobedience. And they say, God will judge you if you continue to be disobedient. So after the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you have the history of the Jews either doing obediently what God requires of them or doing the opposite of what God requires them and welcoming his wrath or his judgment. So the prophet said, hey, God's going to be the judge, but we're going to warn you. They did it properly. In the New Testament, <laughs> the Pharisees got to the point where they were tired of people not practicing the way in which they needed to practice. So they said, hey, let's be the judge too as well. Like, that makes sense. Those of us who are parents understand this. Like, hey, we practice mercy long enough. Time to be the judge. Anybody want to say amen to that? <laughs> okay. And so the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law essentially would crack down on the people and they would judge them, act like God in their lives and say, we're gonna issue condemnation to your life. And Jesus says, whoa, hold on a second. What happened to unconditional love? We often wanna dump a truckload of grace on our life, but have a teaspoon of judgment. And we often want other people to have a dump truck full of judgment and only get a teaspoon of grace. God says, it doesn't work that way, okay? Well, if we desire that for others, then our God can make it so for us. So you can warn, and you can speak biblical truth in love and respect and humbly, but you have to let God do the rest. So as we start this morning, okay, you have to ask yourself, am I acting like a judge when dealing with other people, or am I speaking out of concern? Now, Jesus is going to break this down two ways. He's going to say, I want to talk to you about dealing with believers, okay, those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and then I want to talk to you about dealing with non-believers, okay, as you issue some of these warnings, okay? First thing he's going to talk about is believers, Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Let's look at this. Why do you see, now again, we're talking about believers here. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but you don't notice the log that is in your own eye, four. Or how can you say to your brother, another illustration, hey, let me take that speck out of your eye when there's a huge log in your own eye. Jesus is being funny here, all right? He's the author of humor. He's allowed to be funny. I think Jesus was hilarious. I'm pretty sure he had the best jokes. He had all the jokes. And so he says, um, uh, so you're a hypocrite, verse five. Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, what he's saying here is there is a call for mutual accountability. Let's say that you're driving down the same highway that the man's standing in the middle of, right? And you've chosen to ignore him, so you and a friend are driving down the road. And uh, your friend is driving, and you're in the passenger seat. And you look at them, and you're like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 55? And they're like, what? Like 55 miles an hour, you're going 70. 
right? Or in my family, usually Bethany's like, can you speed up a little bit? Because you're telling a story, and when you start talking, the foot comes off the gas pedal. Just keep going, Jordan. Like, let's get there at some point, right? And so you warn that person, okay? You warn them, right? And you're like, hey, you're speeding. And they look back at you, and what do they say? Everybody does this. You speed too, right? Yeah, well, you do it too. When you call somebody out, uh, usually people just flip it right back on you, okay? And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Now, here's the crazy thing. The traits that usually bother you about other people are often the same habits that you have in yourself, all right? And that's what Jesus is getting at. And he's speaking on how we're to respond. Now, if you uh, see that word speck, you can circle that if you want to in your Bible. Speck is like a little bit of saw, uh, sawdust. You ever walked into like somebody who's woodworking and uh, they're cutting up like boards or whatever and there's no real like system to get rid of that um, sawdust and it gets in your eye and you're like, ah, you know what I mean? It's also when somebody comes up to you like, I have something in my eye. Can you, can you look? Like, it's right right like that and you're like I have, I have no idea it's an eyeball I guess like I don't know what to tell you like what's wrong with you but they can't they can still see but 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 it's a speck in their eye okay that's what Jesus is talking about now a log is interesting now pause for a second here Jesus is speaking like he normally does as a carpenter he spent all of these years being a carpenter and so he's using what he knows to be true in his everyday life to illustrate that for the people who are present in his life a log is like a big, heavy piece of timber. It's like a support beam. Here's the crazy thing. The people who had logs in their eye, that was so big that they couldn't see anything else. They were blind. So the person who has the speck in their eye, they can still see, but the person who has the log in their eye, they can't see at all. So what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, listen, if a man is behind that timber and he can't see anything, he is blind, that means that he has become self-righteous and cannot see true imperfections of himself until he starts pointing it out to others and they push it back to him. So what Jesus is saying here is he's going to speak on this in regards to Luke chapter 18. Now, you know it's important when the pastor brings out two Bibles. <clears throat> So this is the New Living Translation version of the Bible. He's already spoken on this in Luke chapter 18. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to read it for you. Jesus told this story of some who had great confidence in their own righteousness, men who had logs in their eyes, who couldn't see anything but could look at other people, and then Jesus is going to show them that they're truly the ones that struggle as well. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. And the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed this prayer. Maybe he was by himself because he doesn't have any friends. I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everybody else, for I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. You know you're in a bad place when you start pointing at people in the sanctuary, right? I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector, he stood at a distance and he dared not even lift his eyes. He can't even get into the sanctuary. And he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, oh God, be merciful to me for I'm a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee. Now again, Jesus is pointing at the people who had logs in their eyes. And he's saying, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The woman who's caught in adultery, right? Is thrown at Jesus' feet. And they say, hey, we should stone this woman. And Jesus says, you who don't have any sin, you should cast the first stone. So when you are quick to criticize somebody, okay, about what's going on in their life, understand that you most likely struggle with that exact same thing. And here's the crazy thing. That person is the one individual that is most likely to help you get out of your self-righteousness. That person is the one person who can help you get out of the situation that you're in. Jesus tells us that both people have a problem, that both people have an issue, and both need it to come out. And if you refuse to let it come out, you're a hypocrite. Now, we've already talked about that a little bit, but hypocrite is essentially like an actor who gets caught up in playing their part like a method actor in today's society that plays a part and all of a sudden um, they don't know who they are anymore. They can't get out of that role that they're cast in. It's the same thing that's transpiring here. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in our sin, we forget that we're saved until we call somebody else out on an issue. Now here's how it works in my life, and I don't know if it works in your life like this. Uh, this is why I think you're married. Amen? Like, 
there are times when I see inconsistencies in my wife and I call her out on the table and I always say, she flips the tables on me. She says, oh, oh yeah? You might preach on Sunday, but I'm about to preach in this kitchen, <laughs> right? And they'll call you back out. And now both of us are in a situation. You ever been here before? Yeah, will you? Yeah, will you? Yeah, will you? Yeah, will you? What are we, seven? Our kids are looking at us going, are you guys okay? You have an argument right now? You have an argument right now, aren't you? We're going to go upstairs, play at the train. It's okay. Finish, finish what you're doing, right? Instead of doing that, Jesus says, I don't want you to be hypocrites saying that you don't have any sin. I want you to welcome the fact that somebody could help you out. I put that person in your place so that you both can get out of the situations that you are in. If you go, um, you don't have to go there, but 2 Samuel chapter 12, um, David does this. Um, Nathan essentially does this. This is why you mark your place in your Bible so that it looks like you're super smart. The uh, quiz team was here this weekend and they were studying from the book of Hebrews and I feel real dumb. <clears throat> anyway, that's a different story for a different day. So listen to this. <clears throat> I'm in 1 Samuel. How do I get to 1 Samuel? 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, this is exactly what transpires. Nathan the prophet is going to go up to David and he's going to tell him something that's gone on in his life. Not going to be easy for him, but he's going to do it. So the Lord sends Nathan the prophet to tell David a story. He looks at David and he says, David, there were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man, he owned a great many sheep and cattle. And the poor man, he owned nothing but one little lamb. He raised the little lamb. It grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. Sounds like my dog. <clears throat> he cuddled it in his arms like a baby's daughter. And one day, uh, like a baby daughter. And one day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man, but instead of killing the animal from his flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and he killed it and he prepared it for his guest. What do you think David's attitude is like? David is furious. He looks at Nathan and he says, surely as the Lord lives, he vowed any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man and the one he stole. And for having no pity on him, David looks, Nathan looks at David. You know what he says? You're that man. You're it. You do that all the time. He's showing David that he has a log in his eye. He's showing him that he is wrong, that he is off. Man is like a barber that trims all other men but forgets about himself. And when faced with hypocrisy or having the tables turned on you, you have to admit your own faults. <laughs> There's a family, they went to church, and they got done with church, and they get in the car, they're getting ready to go home, and dad starts ripping on the pastor. He's like, I can't believe it. Pastor Jordan today, he was all over the place. I don't know why he doesn't wear a shirt and tie. What's wrong with this man? <clears throat> if he could just dress up one Sunday, that would be great. I mean, come on. Mom kicks in. She's like, I know. And at choir practice today, Carol was there. She sings out of tune all the time. She's like a bird squawking in my ear. And then the little sister kicks in and she goes, oh, uh, absolutely. When we were in children's church today, I, I, I was passing notes and the teacher got upset with me. She gets upset with me all the time. I was running around, all this other stuff. I can't believe it. Why do we even go to children's church? It doesn't make any sense. And the brother, he kicks in just like this. And he goes, yeah, but it wasn't a bad show for a dollar. More is caught than taught, amen? I bet you it was a quiet ride as you go over there. Now look, he says, take out, verse five. Both the speck and the log have to be taken out. Both parties have to seek restoration because both are in the wrong. So the person with the speck may actually be in better position to help remove the log than the other way around. When you find a common problem with a believer, ready for this? You have found an accountability partner. Now, men, you have to be careful that this isn't a woman, and women, you have to be careful that this isn't a man. Okay? But when you have found um, with your brother or sister a common problem, you have found a mutual accountability partner. Somebody that will hold you accountable to your faults. Instead of pushing those people away, we have to welcome them in. And say, yeah, absolutely. Will you help me with this? Will you help me? Will you help me overcome this problem? You have to ask that person for help. That is the definition of humility, is asking somebody for help. What do we do about the unsaved? 
Well, Jesus talks about that. Look at verse six. He says, don't give dogs what is holy or do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So if the sole um, meaning of three to five is talking about your brothers and sisters and when we speak truth to them and help them see kind of the error of their ways and the error of our own ways, what does it look like when I go share the gospel with somebody out in the community and they spit back? What if, for example, to take the illustration one step further, what if that individual who you're sitting next to, you're like, hey, you're speeding, you need to slow down. They look at you and go, you want to see speeding? And they put that gas pedal all the way to the floor, and before you know it, you're going from 70 to 100, right? Here's the hard thing, and I hope this comes across clear. Jesus will tell us that there are times that you need to tell people to pull over, you need to get out of the car, and you need to let them go. This is the most difficult passage to get to, especially when we're passionate about seeing people come to know the same Jesus that we know. Jesus uses dogs and swine. Now, when he talks about a dog, he's not talking about your dog, okay? He's not talking about a domesticated animal here. He's talking about a dog that runs all over the place. And I've been to Israel twice. We didn't see a whole lot of dogs, but we see cats everywhere. And they're all domesticated, and they tell you two things. You know you can't take it home, and two, don't touch it. I can't, like... Uh, prove it biblically, but I'm pretty sure cats are not destined for the gates of glory. I think they go somewhere else, but that's a different story for (laughs) all another day. I heard that amen, so somebody's uh, somebody's on there. Now, pigs are a little bit different. You don't see pigs in Israel either, and there's a reason for it. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, the Jews were told you cannot eat or touch pigs. I remember when I was growing up, uh, Benny Meekum, never forget him, uh, he raised pigs. And I always thought it was awesome. We would go to his farm. My dad would be there. He had an in-ground pool, so cool. Got baptized in his pool. And um, uh, we would go, like, wander off. And he's like, don't touch the pigs. We're like, yeah, whatever. And he's like, no, mama pigs are mean. I don't know if you know this or not, but mama pigs are mean. Like, they'll eat your soul. They don't care about anything about life. They're like cats. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But Jews said they're ceremonially... I just remember uh, Benny would look at me. And he's like, don't, don't, don't touch the pigs. He's like, it's not good. It's, Jews have the same law. They're like, don't touch the pigs. They're not good for you. They're considered unholy. Now, when Jesus says here, go back to the text. He says, you don't give to dogs what is holy and you do not throw your pearls before pigs because they'll just consume them and eat them. They don't even know that they're pearls. He's essentially saying there's gonna be people that you get to in your life that you're gonna proclaim the goodness of God and they're gonna look back at you and they're going to wanna trip you up. They're gonna wanna cause you harm. They're gonna wanna cause you problems. They're gonna wanna talk about things that are endless genealogies. They're gonna try to throw you off course. And he says, listen, you can proclaim the gospel to somebody once, twice, maybe three times, but be very careful when it causes you uh, harm or when you lack discernment. And he says, uh, this is like every time I talk to this person, it ends in a fight. Every time you're at work and there's that individual who is at your workplace and you're trying to share the gospel with them, it's just, they constantly reject it, right? There's always a fight with it. Well, what about this? In my world, this is where people come up to me and they constantly want to debate things that are not on the gospel and they want to throw me off course, Okay, this is where sadly sometimes to follow in the footsteps of Jesus is to walk away from others or let them walk away from us. And you look at it and you go, I don't, I don't like that. 41 times in the gospels, Jesus either walks away from somebody or lets somebody walk away from him. 41 times. Why? Because it threw him off of his mission and he knew that he was going to have a situation where he was just going to get caught up. And he says, look, he uses the word holy. He says, what is sacred or what is holy? That refers to special consecrated food that only priests and their families could have and participate in. It would be unthinkable to give this sacred food to scavenger dogs or pigs. There's going to be argumentative people in this world that cannot grasp the value of the gospel, and you might just need to move on. Lost and difficult people are different than toxic people. And we need to um, state the difference. Let me give you three types of toxic people that might be throwing you off course. Number one, people who are having murderous spirits. They constantly just want to degrade the Jesus that you worship. That might be somebody you need to walk away from. 
Number two, somebody that just wants to control you. Just wants to constantly control and bring that back to something that is irrelevant. Number three, somebody who has a heart that loves to just hate. That's super tough. And here's my prayer when I get in, in confrontation with those people. I look at Jesus and I say, Jesus, it might not be me, but there, would you put somebody else in their life that would be able to clearly communicate the gospel that would make sense to them? Would you put somebody in their path that they could articulate the text in a way that I can't so that they would come to know you? Once you've identified these people, you have to just avoid them. Now you're looking at me and you're saying, wait, Pastor Jordan, uh, are you saying there's sometimes when we don't evangelize and share our faith? Sometimes. Sometimes it's inappropriate. Sometimes um, sharing our faith requires that we use discretion. There's sometimes in places where witnessing can be rude and offensive and it doesn't help. And you have to rethink your approach. Let me give you an example. Sandy... um, ate in the break room every single day at her job. And as she sits in the break room and she eats, Carl would come in and he would sit next to her. And he loved Sandy. Sandy's widow, um, older. Um, Carl was single, never got married. And he looked at Sandy all the time and he said, he said hey, I just, wanna, I just want you to know that, that I really like talking to you. She looked at him and she said, you know, I really like talking to you. You know, if you ever need anything, just let me know. I'd be glad to talk to you. And she knew that what her pastor said was important, that she was called to communicate the gospel. Sandy loved Jesus. She knew Jesus, but Carl, not so much. And so she was constantly looking for a way where Carl could come to know the Lord. Sure enough, one day, Carl knocks on her door at 10 o'clock at night. She was just getting ready to go to bed. She pulls open the door and the chain's still on it, and there's Carl. He's got tears in his eyes. He says, hey, Sandy, is there any way that we could talk? She says, you know, it's getting kind of late, and there's nobody really here, and uh, I'm just not so sure. I'm just not so sure that this is a good time. He says, you know what? I feel so close to you. I feel so connected to you. I feel like you're the only person that I can talk to about what's going on in my life. And she thinks to herself in her head, she thinks, maybe this is the moment where Carl's going to trust Jesus as his Savior. Maybe this is where God's going to do an amazing work. Maybe this is it. And she slides the lock off the door. She lets him in. And the unthinkable happens. She would have been safe if she would have used discernment. Don't throw away your God-given discernment. Satan misused scripture all the time with Jesus. Remember Jesus is fasting, he's in the desert, here comes Satan, right? And what does he use at him? Bible verses. He throws verses at the Son of God. And Jesus says, I'm going to crush you at some point, but that's not going to happen now. There's a mob of people that push Jesus to the edge of a cliff who hate him. And you say, hey, one day I'm going to be the judge. And you'll get yours. But for now, I'm going to pass right through you. I love that verse. It just slides right through. He tells Satan, go away. Satan uses the same tricks in your life today. When you share the gospel, resistance is normal. But when our witness provokes, we may need to consider another time and place. Be discerning. All people need to hear the gospel. But effective witnessing occurs in appropriate settings And sometimes people won't receive what you say, but refuse it. And that's what Jesus says in verse 6. When you come up to somebody, and when you speak the truth in love, and you're truly concerned about them, and they flip the tables on you, that might be a situation where mutual accountability needs to happen and take place if they're believers. But if somebody looks at you and wants to throw condemnation to you who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it might be time to move along. It might be time to go to the next one. Remember this. When you see a brother or sister in sin, there's two things you don't know. One, you don't know how hard he or she is trying not to sin. And number two, we don't know the power of the forces that have assaulted that individual. 
And we also don't know what we would have done in the same situations and circumstances. So Jesus is essentially saying that I want you to love well, I want you to love often, and let me be the judge. Have the attitude of love in all things, unconditionally, but not unconditional approval. Seeking the applause of your Savior, as the Bible says, so that it may go well with you. Let me pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth and uh, for what it says. Very interesting passage of Scripture, as you have articulated so clearly to us on how we need to be careful about the people in our lives. And we would ask first and foremost that you would just help us that we would not judge somebody to sit on the throne that you are on, to have a hypercritical attitude against them so that we feel better about ourselves. Forgive us for those things. Help us to see that we too struggle with sin. We struggle with conforming to your word. And identify for us right now the people and the places in our life that we have judged. Help us to repent of those things. And if they're believers, that we may engage in a relationship of mutual accountability with them and ask them for our help. It is amazing, God, how many times in the text, the people that have logs in their eyes are the religious. And so we need to look at ourselves and understand that as we're critical towards others, there may be opportunities for help so that you would be honored and glorified. And as we share the gospel, the good news that you came, died, and rose again, Help us to be able to identify and discern these dogs and pigs who want to trip us up, who are constantly pushing back, who take us off course, who deviate from what you want us to participate in. For the people who have murderous spirits, for the people who want us, uh, who wish harm for us, give us eyes to see that. We pray that you protect us as we go out and proclaim your word. That it would not be cause for pause to cease preaching the good news. But that it would be effective. Help us, God, in our endeavors as we want to stay living on point for you. God, we pray that you ultimately be glorified and that you would help us as we conform more to the image of your son it's in your name that we pray amen thank you for listening to the community gospel church podcast if you would like to support this ministry financially simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the contribute tab